Okay, so doing kind of an exploration of the box of games called Rome. Um, and this is the second in the series. This is Imperium. Now you'll notice I'm missing a piece. Uh, I bought it used and there's supposed to be a large black block or something. This will work fine. It's kind of a pity, but that's, that's okay. Um, so this one's a little bit more like a, a, a well, let's go into it. But the goal here is to gather victory points. It's less of uh, the kind of pure one-on-one -on -one little strategy game that uh, Hannibal versus Rome worked out to be. So, in this case, the goal is to collect points by generating influence in various Roman provinces, and you want to hit or exceed 50 points in order to win. And obviously, if you know, you're running ahead of everyone else, it's probably more impressive than uh, if everybody's kind of packed together. So what's the mechanism of this game? Well, let's look at the, the base uh, sort of sequence of play, as it were. Each person chooses some cards to play, and everybody has the same deck with all the provinces. I believe they have one card from each of the different provinces, and these are the bigger areas. So Africa includes the smaller areas that were used in, in Hannibal versus Rome, uh, Egypt, Syria, etc. Each of them has a card which indicates the points that you can score on it, and those are also noted on the board. Uh, and then you have some special cards, just a couple of them. Uh, one is Ear of the Emperor, I don't think they mean the physical object. And another is bread and circuses, which, you know, don't really seem to affect anything about... You know, they don't seem linked uh, properly to the game in any sense. I mean, why, bread and circuses is a cool name, and Ear of the Emperor is a cool name. But essentially, they're just these mechanisms that take place in the play. All right, let's look at... Uh, what happens though, you get to pick three of these and you stack them. And then you reveal them and they indicate where you get influence tokens. Okay. And when it comes down, after you reveal your cards, and let's see, oh, there's another special one, the Oracle. The Oracle is a little bit more uh, linked to what the name means. Okay. So you set a stack of three cards. Now, let's ignore the special cards. Without them, all these say is when everybody flips their cards over, you get to put a token in that area. So for example, if I had the Gallia card in my pile, I would get a token in Gallia. Okay, that sounds kind of interesting. What's the point? Well, the point here is each turn, this thing says we're going to count who has what points here, okay? And whoever has the most tokens in that area gets the first point value for that area, second most gets the second, third most gets the third. There's some modifiers depending on the number of players you have. You can't score if you're in last place, no matter how many players there are. So for example, if it's a four player game, uh, Egypt is 864 rather than 8642. Um, also, if you're tied for a position, you get the next lowest position shared. So, for example, if two people each had a token in Hispania, they'd each get five points instead of uh, one getting six or both getting six or anything. That's just, you know, the way the scoring works. Okay, what about the special cards? Um, okay, yeah, we'll go into them. So the special cards each have special effects. Ear of the Emperor, well, let's look at the Oracle the first, because I think that's the easiest of the pile. If you play that on top of your deck, and I think it has to be on top, am I wrong? Yes. If you put that on top of your three cards that you're laying down, um, what that means is that after everyone reveals their cards, you get to pull your deck back and play again. And I think this is only usable once, i.e. if you play the Oracle, you don't 
ever get to do it again. So, you know, there's some choice there as to when you want to make that uh, extra bonus there. Okay. Um, if multiple people play their oracle in the same round, they replay simultaneously. So you don't get an advantage over anyone else who plays the oracle. Ear of the Emperor is also a one-use card. The way this works is, and I think you have to again play it on top. No, you can play it anywhere. Um, you score more than one province per round. Remember what we said, wherever this is scores? Well, there's an order to these. And... That's specified, yeah. Uh, okay, so it goes kind of in order of value. Africa's first, then Syria, then Illyricum. Unfortunately, not a nice uh, progression on the board. Then Gallia, uh, then over to Asia, uh, Hispania, Macedonia, and finally Egypt. You don't, nobody's actually playing in Rome in this one. Okay. If you win, uh, so, yeah. if you win, you get to not have to play again. Um, okay. So, the Ear of the Emperor, though, says it's not just going to score this, the current place where the token is, but we're going to score another one, too. And lots of people can play Ears of the Emperor. And that just says you you score for multiple rounds uh, entire overall. So, for example, if three people played uh, the Ear of the Emperor at the same time, then there'd be four provinces scored. The one that the token's in, and three succeeding ones for the Ear of the Emperor. So, if you have an advantage somewhere, you might want to push uh, to score more, more, more areas. And then the token jumps to the next unscored province in the sequence. And the sequence goes around in a circle, which is to say, after you do Egyptus, you go back to Africa. Okay, so this also is a one-time only card to play. And once you play it, it's discarded from the game. However, the Bread and the Circus is, is not. You play this as your bottom card. And what it says is the card directly above it it's two tokens instead of one. And you're allowed to play this one as many times as you like. Pretty cool. Um, one restriction on the number of cards you can play, if you don't have any tokens off board, you can't play. Uh, so you can only play as many cards, whether they're special cards or otherwise, as the number of tokens you have in play. So Ear of the Emperor actually expends one of your tokens. Well, yeah. <laughs> Oracle doesn't because you get to play that many cards again. You're not forced. Uh, you, the cards that you play don't really matter. Bread and Circus is links to a token, so like the provinces, you get to play it in, in the same way. Now, if you are the single player with the highest influence in a province after it's scored, you leave one token in the capital and you're counted as the pro council and that means you have an influence marker still in that territory but also you score a bonus point for this capital and one additional bonus point for each adjacent province um, that you also have uh, tokens in so for example here if I scored Carthage I would get Egypt mm. I would get Syria and I would get Asia. I would get four points additional for all those pro councils I had. They, they chain. And likewise, I could go up into Hispania too for points. Uh, you know, everything's adjacent to things. And it's not just adjacent, but it's linked chains of provinces. So however many provinces you have that are adjacent to other provinces that can all connect back, you get those points for. They have to be pro councils though. They can't just be tokens sitting in the province. Something like this is only worth one. I had to have won Egyptus to get the additional bonus for that. Okay. Game ends. Oh, game ends when somebody hits 40. I lied. It's not 50. And 
uh, as soon as the, somebody hits 40 and one person is in the lead, the game is over and that person has won. And it could be that people stay tied and just moving on and on and on and I guess you have to wrap around in that case. And then they give some points for if you didn't make Emperor. And Emperor is what happens if you win and you get some of these other titles but they don't really... I mean, nobody who's playing at this level of influence wasn't already, uh, you know, a senator, right? <laughs> or, and probably most of the players have been consuls. Whatever. Anyway, it doesn't really represent anything historical. There's no real link to that. It's just the gameplay itself that's uh, on show here. Hmm. Um, all right. I'll pause for a while and come back. Okay, so here we still are at the beginning of the game, uh, but everybody's made their picks. First uh, auction, whatever, is Africa. Let's see what happened. Purple. Purple picked a two, three, four. So two. Eh, I hate round counters. Three and four. Blue did one, two, four. Wanting to try to get that African point. Orange, okay. Orange did one eight, and they doubled up in eight. Grab some early points, and then start setting up the groundwork for those later points. And yes, this feels almost like a political uh, campaign game. One three five, all the odd numbers, <laughs> and then here. Four, five, and six. And these were generated semi-randomly, which is to say, I kind of rolled dice, but not uh, not in a normal sort of way. I looked at each province, and I said, okay, odds they want Africa, uh, and then odds they want to try Syria. And on ones, I kind of uh, bubbled them up. That's just to generate sort of the starting feel for these different characters, see what they have. Okay, so we got three people tied for first in Africa. Nobody gets Pro Council of Africa. Green, orange, and blue all move up a point. And they're in the lead, but my, nobody went big. And that was probably a mistake. I think it's probably a good idea to get that Pro Council trip. Counter goes to Syria. And now people have started differentiating their strategy. And we're going to see these decisions being made based on current location as well as uh, you know what what you can gain immediately so I'll see how that works out okay let's look at what the second round of influence does um, and we'll start with the same player purple okay purple through one into the lyricum Ooh. I'm wondering, the oracle's okay because you get to see everyone else's and then rebid, so you get to see what they do. And he put two over here into Syria, trying to get that proconsular power. Well, blue did the same kind of thing, two into Syria, and that's kind of a bone. And one into Macedonia where nobody is. Let's look at orange. Orange threw one into Africa, of all places, which looks pretty weak. You know, why would you start bidding there? Well, I don't know. And heavier into Macedonia. Green. Kind of spread things out. Three. Five. And he slipped one into Egypt to see what kind of bidding he can get there. And then red. Red put two into Asia and one into Gallia, grabbing the lead on both of those. Now, here we have a, a bid. Now, second place here is worth two. Purple and blue each get a second place finish there. Points are scored. This moves over to three, and all the pieces go away because nobody won it. And now we go to another round. Okay, let's expose the cards. Blue, one in Macedonia, and two here in Hispania, trying to 
make an upset there. Not that, you know, we're all the way on Illyricum, so that's unlikely. Orange, two in Macedonia. Wow, they're piling them up there. And now they're going into Egypt again. Try to build up an overwhelming lead. Green. A three and a pair of fives, grabbing the territories they already have, making sure they get their power, perhaps. Okay, four in Gallia. Wow, that was easy. And seven gets two. They're trying to put a challenge there. I dropped a piece. Oh, stupid round pieces. And finally, purple, who went with two in Illyricum, which will eke that out. And one down in Macedonia. Now, Macedonia has a fourth place. Worth two points, that's better than putting a point in Africa, in a sense. Okay, well, let's see what we have. No special abilities, so Illyricum goes. Purple gets three points. One, two, three. Green gets two. And now, and I kind of cheated. This is a problem with this, is it's very easy to end up putting pieces in the capital by accident. Purple ends up with an extra point for having a proconsulate, and if they can connect proconsuls now, they'll start getting more points. Of course, that doesn't look very likely, because both four and seven, which are the adjacent areas, they're far behind. Of course, this gives them an advantage for later. And now this moves on to four, and we go around again. Okay, so now we're uh, scoring the fourth area, Gallia. Let's start with orange this time. Orange puts a seven down. And a couple sixes into Hispania there. Green puts a two down and two into Asia. Red goes seven, six, four. Solidifying themselves. And you'll notice some of the people like Red are running low on pieces. Now he's going to get more back, but it's possible you could run out and not have enough to play your full complement. Seven, six, four for purple. And blue goes eight, seven, six. And still nobody's playing those special cards. They seem too valuable to waste at this point in the game, although you could get more points. Uh, because of the pro councilships, it's hard to tell. Let's see what happened. Only Gallia got scored here. Red wins it, taking four victory points, and they finally get some. Purple comes in second with three. And blue is in third with two. Nobody gets the fourth place. Red gets an extra point for their uh, pro consulate. Oh, I took their piece off the board. And now it just moves over to five, which looks like it's dominated by green. Somebody might want to jump in and get an extra two points fairly cheap for a piece. Of course, a lot of people might want that and just get one or none. All right. Let us, uh, let us keep going, I guess. Yeah. So I've got a problem here, which is that I'm trying to see what the value of showing continued play is of this if I don't show every action, but showing every action is painful. Uh, probably not just to me. Alright, let's take a look, I guess, for this one, and I'll keep trying to... I think we got a spread of red going up into the sevens. Purple is looking far in the future to low value stuff, but maybe trying to link up. Two sevens, and they slipped into five to try to get that point for cheap. Orange making a play for Hispania, and green doing weird looking stuff 
playing way far away for low value stuff and then fairly heavily for the one for some reason. Okay, so five gets scored here. Green wins it for five points. That puts them to eight. Red gets four, which puts them up to nine. And blue manages to sleeze in two points, which isn't bad at all. Pieces go away, except for Green, who has a pro counselor holding here. Ah, uh, oh geez, I thought he had Syria pro counsel. I think he did, and I bumped it. <sighs> uh, definitely a problem, those little pro counsel markers. So, if that's the case, if he had the Syrian pro counsel, and I think I, he did, then he gets two points for that victory which was kind of unexpected and gets to hold the pro consulship and now it goes over to six and we continue on and you know what I don't think that anybody's getting enough out of this uh, playthrough to be worth finishing the game up I'm gonna come uh, nah there's not a lot to say here so obviously it's gonna get more exciting as we get close to that 40 point point I'm not gonna play it out to there and because I don't think there's enough, you know, this is like playing out a card game, really. Uh, yes, it's interesting. Yes, there's cool, cool p positions on the board and everything. But honestly, it's too much effort to play solitaire. Although I think it would be kind of fun to play with other people. Um, once you get to where, you know, the oracle is important, it's important to see what everybody has because then you can slip into a place and get that extra point. Or the ear of the emperor, where you get to slip the black marker forward and make sure that the place that you're already going into that nobody's expecting and they aren't piling into will score. Now, we saw a lot in this game of people kind of playing for the future anyway. So I don't know how much the ear of the emperor would be an advantage with players who act that way, who, who really are constantly building up uh, their stockpiles. But I'm sure it comes in handy now and then in a game. Uh, I think the oracle is much more powerful in terms of being able to see, can I win the area that I'm in right now? Did somebody try to sleaze it? Uh, or... You know, should I play the Ear of the Emperor to get the next air area? Or should I just be building up my reserves? Those kind of choices, I think the Oracle for a one shot, as we get close to that 40 point limit, is going to be very valuable. The Ear of the Emperor, I think a lot less so, but there may be cases, especially in conjunction with the Oracle, where it would be interesting. And I'll load this one up. Again, I don't want to finish it up. It's just not, you know. <laughs> it it would be like playing a game of hearts uh, solitaire it's there's too many different people that I have to run it's too much like a euro in that sense but I find unlike a lot of the euros where there's a lot of different decisions to make that this one has a very nice flow to it very much like a game of cards would where the decisions aren't that complex you're not going to sit there pondering oh but if I do that you just play it you know uh you know, I remember El Grande being kind of like that, too, where you could make these quick decisions. You didn't have to sit there thinking forever. And I think that's the cool part about these secret uh, choice games that I like a lot better than, say, the Puerto Rico-type style, where everything's open information and you just you have so much ability to try to figure out, oh, wait a minute, I actually can optimize my move at this point using game theory or whatever. All right, up this goes.